Just at the beginning of lockdown I got an email in my inbox advertising a training course for worship leaders. And uh, I don't normally look at emails like this but there was something about it that drew me uh, in and I looked at the material, I thought it looked quite promising, I took it to the recent meeting of circuit preachers and worship leaders and I wanted to know what they thought about this. Would this be a suitable course for preachers and worship leaders to think about worship uh, and their role uh, within it and maybe opening it up to uh, anyone else that uh, was involved in worship or might be interested in leading worship. And we did a session uh, together in our meeting and uh, it, it went well but a wise voice piped up and said it's not just about the people at the front. Worship, yes, you know, the, these people uh, might facilitate worship for everyone but worship is actually is about the whole church community and all of us have a part to play and therefore in trying to just invite people who might be interested in leading worship won't be missing a trick and actually shouldn't we be encouraging everyone or as many people as want to to come together and reflect upon this thing that we call worship and it was agreed that once we got June out of the way, once we got uh, Bible Month and looking at the Book of Ruth, then we would look to uh, begin such a course and use this service as a means of asking that question, what is worship? So let me ask you the question. How would you respond when uh, asked what worship is? You might say, well, Steve, isn't it what we're doing at the moment? Isn't it this uh, hour or so that we, uh, we spend uh, together, although, of course, scattered, but, uh, but worshipping together? We call it a service of worship, don't we? Or you might dig a bit deeper than that and you might look at what's within the service and, and look at what sort of addresses God directly. You might look at uh, the hymns and prayers and say, well, that's worship within the service. And you'd be right, but you would be incomplete. Because I want to suggest to you today that worship is more than just what we do. It's about being rather than doing. Because we could create a list of things that we call worship. Uh, and as we say, that might be hymns and songs and prayers and, uh, and such like. You might want to take it out further. If you, uh, if you have a working life, you might want to say, well, my, my work is my worship what I offer to uh, to God but actually if we look at the words of Jesus we see that uh, worship is more than just the things that we do on the outside Matthew chapter 15 Jesus is criticizing the religious people uh, around him and he says they honor me with their lips but their hearts are far from me and their worship is in vain in other words, he's saying that they're saying and doing the right things on the outside. But inside they are a million miles away from God. Worship is about what we do on the inside as well as what we do on the outside. It has to be because worship is worth ship. It's, uh, the two words are very closely related. It's about we, we worship something that we give worth to in our lives. And if our hearts are not in it, then how can we give worth to that uh, thing? True worship happens when what we do on the outside, our words, our actions, match up with what is coming from our heart. Let's go back to the picture that we used for our prayers earlier on. And in the psalm we read, all your works praise you. Now the human being here might very well be worshipping God in the face of such an awe-inspiring view. But the psalmist says not just humans or even everything with breath praises you, but all your works praise you. And that includes the mountains. So what does it mean to say that the mountains are praising God, that they are engaged in worship? 
Well, they're praising God, they're bringing praise to God by being mountains. They're being what God intended them to be. They are doing the mountain thing on the outside and on the inside too, because of course they can do no other. There is and always will be a total consistency in their existence. But as human beings, we are, we are capable of being inconsistent. And true worship will only happen when what is seen on the outside, our outward actions, match up, match up with who we are at heart. The worship leading training course that I mentioned earlier on um, has the rather snappy title How Would Jesus Lead Worship? And I have to say my first reaction to that was negative. I thought that whoever had put it together was trying to push a particular style of worship, a particular way of doing things going back to the outside again and somehow trying to claim that it had the divine stamp of approval. I needn't have worried Rather, what the course is about is looking at principles, helping us to look at the life of Jesus, how Jesus lived his life, the values behind it, and what we can take from that that helps us in our worshipping lives. This little clip hopefully should make it a bit clearer. When I was growing up in the 90s, everyone knew what WWJD meant. We wore it around our wrists, Christian bands sang about it, and we earnestly asked each other at late night youth meetings, what would Jesus do? But you know, the questions were never about things like, should I eat fish or pork for dinner? Or should I mostly travel by foot or by donkey? The kinds of questions that we might actually see answered in Jesus' earthly life. No, they were very 1990s youth culture specific questions. Should I be dating non-Christians? How long is too long to spend playing on my PlayStation 1? Or should Christians go clubbing? We knew that those questions didn't have direct answers in Jesus' life. But as we sought to know Jesus better, we let his character and values spread into every part of our lives. So asking what would Jesus do made some strange sense. The same goes for leading worship. In the Bible, we don't see Jesus playing the organ or the guitar because he worshipped like the first century Jew that he was. We may need to shift our perspective a little to see that worship is so much more than just music and church services. It's true that Jesus sang, prayed and gathered with others to worship. But deeper than that, his whole life was dedicated to the obedient worship of God. He lived in close relationship with his father, empowered by the Holy Spirit to glorify God in everything he did. And that should be our role model for everything, including the ways we lead worship in church. So take a moment to pause this video and either reflect personally or discuss as a group around this question. What aspects of Jesus' life and character could inspire you as a worship leader or team? You've got me back again. You can, of course, pause the video and reflect a bit more on that question if you want. But if you are still uh, with me, then let's have a look at that passage that we heard from Matthew and see what we can learn from the way that Jesus approaches things in those uh, verses. First of all, Jesus says that we can be so absorbed in a particular way of worship, in a, in a particular religious viewpoint, that we completely fail to see God at work. Again, he criticises those religious people around him. He says, well, John the Baptist came to you and they said, oh, he's too serious. Uh, he's got a demon. Uh, they rejected John the Baptist and his style of ministry. And then Jesus, I won't say it was a completely opposite, but Jesus gives the impression that uh, it's going off in the opposite uh, direction. And they said, oh, it's not serious enough what, uh, what you're doing. You, uh, and you're mixing with those people that you shouldn't be mixing with, sinners and, uh, and such like. And Jesus was saying, because they were set in their ways. 
They were failing to see that here God was at work. And how are we in our worshipful lives? Are we open enough to be able to see where God is doing new and maybe unexpected things and to rejoice as a result, particularly in these times of upheaval? And then secondly, as Jesus praises God, he addresses God as Father. And in that one word, Jesus gives us two wonderful ways of approaching God. And, and I do appreciate that, uh, as with lots of illustrations, uh, some people may find, because of their own experience, that word a difficult one to work with. But Jesus is wanting to suggest that God is our perfect Father. But in those words are encompassed, first of all, that sense that the Father is the head of the household. The Father is a figure of power and authority as well as being a provider for the family. And as Jesus goes on to say that uh, God is also the Lord of heaven and earth, that is a pretty big household. And therefore, when we approach God in that way, then there are elements of worship that must include trust, that must include submission, that must include obedience. But never fear. So often fear can be in our minds as we relate to, uh, to God. But that's where that other aspect of Father comes in, that Jesus teaches us. To pray Abba, to use that Aramaic word that speaks of a child's first words uh, trying to express who their father is and paints us a picture of that intimate relation between a child and a child's father. That's how God teaches us to view God. At one and the same time, someone that we should trust absolutely that we hand power and authority to the, to whom we are obedient but also someone who loves us way more than any earthly father ever could someone who cares for his children and Jesus goes on to say that he's thankful that the secret things of God the hidden things of God have been revealed to everyone not just exclusively to the wise, to the special ones, but to anyone who has ears to hear and a faith that is childlike enough to receive. And that's wonderful news for us in our worshipping lives and our relationship with God. Because it means that we don't need to pretend. There's no need for pretense. There's no need for unworthiness because God wants to get to know us and wants us to come to him just as we are. God has made that possible, made that relation possible through Jesus, through the Son, who Jesus says in these verses, it is the Son who reveals the Father. Through his words, through his death, through his resurrection, through his ongoing love, Jesus is the one who makes that relationship possible for us. And finally, Jesus goes on to say, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And I suspect that is a go to verse for many of us, that when we're stressed, when we need words of renewal and reassurance, these are words that we seek out. Now, I don't want to go down that line of the individual today, rather to say that we are meant as a worshipping community, the individual worshippers gathered together, we're meant to be here. To be a people in whom people can come and find that rest. As we worship, and as we bring those lives of worship together, we become in the here and now the body of Christ. And that invitation still goes out from Jesus still goes out to people saying, come to me and you will find rest. A few uh, weeks ago, I was quoting the rabbinic tradition about Abraham, that uh, in the desert, Abraham's tent flaps were always open on every side of his tent. 
so that whoever was coming from whichever direction they came from, they would always find hospitality and shelter. And that seems a good image on which to finish. That as worshippers together, as our worship builds something, builds community, we become a place where people can find that shelter, that security, that rest, that hospitality, whatever you like to call it. We create something that is way bigger than ours, that truly deserves to be called the body of Christ. As each one of us brings our daily offering of worship to our God, whom we might very well call the Servant King.